lot of the tourists that just want to see the sex workers because we're like quite unique in how we have our red light district. It's Friday evening in Amsterdam's infamous red light district, known locally as De Walla. Officers are on the beat in this notoriously rowdy part of the city, one that is only just starting to recover from the COVID pandemic. It was a complete stop when the measures took place and now it's slowly starting to build up again, getting more crowded, but it isn't near the levels pre-COVID. Before the pandemic, these streets were packed with people from all over the world who'd come to explore an adult playground. But now some locals are hoping to attract a different type of tourist. Lovely. Sex machine. What the fuck? My name is Yvette Lurch and I am a sex worker and I've been working in the sex industry for the last 10 years. Prostitution has always been like something that I always was very interested in and has always been on my list like, oh, I want to try that out. Davala's red light district is known worldwide for these windows. One of the sex workers behind them is Yvette. This brothel has been here for years. It's nice to work in a place where you feel like within a community or being taken care of. I think it's really, it's really nice to be around other sex workers and people who have been in the industry for a longer time. So you can ask for advice when you need to and people can look out for each other. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, can we have a look around? Yeah. Sex work in Holland isn't as unregulated as it may seem to outsiders. There's a lot of red tape in the red light district. All sex workers are meant to register and work only from licensed brothels like these ones. Yvette is trying to normalize and destigmatize sex work. So this is the room. Uh-huh. This is your room then. This yeah, is this is where yeah, yeah, this is where I work with clients. Okay. And um, this is where you bring the clients. Yeah. Okay. And then I well then I, you would undress. Yes. Um, I would ask you to wash yourself or I would wash you. Mm -hmm. Your penis, obviously. Yes. Um, and then we would get into bed. Okay. When you're at the window, are you deciding if you like a client? Have you got that control? Oh, yes. How do you decide? Yeah, maybe you've noticed, but you can't really enter this building unless I open the door for you. Uh -huh. I like to work with people and I like to work with sexuality. It gives me a lot of freedom. I'm able to make a fair bit of money in a smaller amount of time. It provides me a lot of free time so I can do the things I find really important. For Yvette and her clients, this is a workplace that offers a legal and safe service, one that's often called the oldest profession in the world. There's nothing wrong with sex workers, with the way they do their, their work. If we have prostitution in our city, and we do have prostitution, I want the women and men who do the work um, be proud of what they are doing and be respected for who they are. While the mayor may say she respects sex workers, she's leading an effort to banish them from the red light district and the heart of the city. Amsterdam's mayor Femke Halsema and many others would like to see the red light district relocate from here in the heart of Amsterdam to here, the proposed site of an erotic centre, a 20 minute drive from the city centre. What you're doing, it's no longer window prostitution. They become brothels or closed shops where the women work. You can imagine, for instance, that uh, people will have an app or something where you can look the women up on your telephone, but without seeing them in the windows. And it means that people who are passing uh, cannot laugh at them anymore.
Government officials are very reluctant to discuss the plans to move the red light district. The mayor, whose plan it is, refuses to talk to us, as does her spokesman. But we have found the initial concept drawn up by an architect who was commissioned to conduct a study into how to retain the area's social cohesion. This modern industrial style tower is a far cry from the beating heart of the city. And it could be built at one of nine potential out of town sites under consideration. The mayor wants to move all the visible sexual activity or sex visible sex industry move out of the city center into an erotic center somewhere and she's doing this by sort of making the claim that places will be safer that it will be more controlled that it would be good for sex workers just again get up the stairs would you continue the work if you did have to move to an no, exotic erotic no, center? No, I would, I would not move to another place with window work. No, I want to do my window work here and I would not move to an erotic center. The government says it wants to close the windows to encourage a better quality tourist. And some agree. You hear about the red leg district, you hear about the coffee shops. You hear about these kind of stuff, and uh, when actually Amsterdam has a lot more to offer. Closing down the windows would be for sure a negative thing for the industry that is the prostitution industry, which is huge in Amsterdam and uh, something that a lot of tourists come for. However, my stance on, on, on tourism is that the quality of tourism would improve. Amsterdam is home to some of the most important historical and cultural locations in Europe, from the Van Gogh Museum to the Anne Frank House. Cutting edge museums, galleries and restaurants sit between time-worn churches and palaces. The red light district is mainly merchant houses built in a boom in the late 1600s. The mayor wants tourists to come here for the architecture and fine dining not sex and other temptations. Cannabis coffee shops like these operate in a kind of legal gray area. It's still illegal to produce cannabis here in Holland, but buying small quantities in one of these coffee shops has been tolerated for decades. But as the city authorities start to try to clean up Amsterdam's image, it's not sure how long foreigners are going to be able to enjoy Amsterdam's liberal values. What are you looking for? Are you looking for a gram or do you want to smoke a pre-roll joint? Before the pandemic, shops like this one would be full of international tourists enjoying the legal cannabis experience. So uh, no, I would go for a silver haze joint. Take a few puffs, wait 10 minutes, see if you can handle the feeling. Are most of your clients locals or foreigners, tourists? Uh, it used to be tourists. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, I think if you percentage-wise, it's like uh, 60 to 40. Mm. Eric is the manager. He's run the coffee shop for years. It's really an Amsterdam thing. So if people come from other countries, the first thing you think about Holland, of course, it's the coffee shops. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very well known to all over the world. But now the council is trying to get rid of most of the coffee shop, especially in the center. What are the government plans for the selling of marijuana in coffee shops? All over Holland, you have to be a Dutch person to buy uh, wheat in a coffee shop. Foreigners are not allowed anymore in those shops. Our new mayor, Halsema, she's trying to get also to apply that rule in Amsterdam. And how far progressed is that planning? They're still working on it. Our mayor wants it one way or the other. At the end, she is the mayor, so she can decide. And what will happen if that goes through? If foreigners cannot buy marijuana in the coffee shops of Amsterdam, what will happen, do you think? It's just going to be huge. All of the streets in Amsterdam, especially in the centre, also in the red light district, they're all orientated on tourists. So if you uh, make the coffee shops only accessible for local people, then the tourists are going to stay away. But I want to try to get rid of the, the red light district in the center. 
Eric and the other coffee shop owners believe that restricting the sale of cannabis to locals will only drive foreigners to illegal dealers. The buying of marijuana from people that still are coming here is not going away. You know, they still want to buy. So what happens is they get, you get street dealers again. The best thing to do is to sit here and have you smoke. It's nice and you're comfortable. If something happens, we can help you. And it's a nice environment. Ridding a city of sex and drugs might seem like a sensible idea, but a surge in cheap European flights has bolstered Holland's tourism industry, which now accounts for 5% of GDP and employs 10% of the workforce. And many tourists want to experience these more taboo attractions, like Amsterdam's smoke boats. The most important rule we have here on the smoke boat is no stress. We're here to relax, guys. Just light up the joint, lay back, and then and get nice and high, you know? You know how we do it. So let's rock and roll. How important is the coffee shops and the smoking and the marijuana in drawing tourists to, to Amsterdam, do you think? Oh, that's a big part of it. I think what I always say about Amsterdam, the three crosses on the on the flag, I always say like sex, drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> That's what Amsterdam looks like for me then. Everyone is here to have a good time, you know, to be themselves, uh, do what they cannot do in their countries, you know. Uh, so it's a big part uh, and a big role of the community here. I think everyone's stoned. Just part of the land, man. When it gets later in the day, the crowds come in, vast crowds, and they completely take over the neighborhood. Really? That's the big problem. I'm out for a tour of Amsterdam with Olive Ulrich. You could call him an activist resident. During COVID, it was absolutely abandoned. There was no, nobody on the streets. It was completely empty and uh, yeah, silent. It was amazing. It's a miracle. And he's made reclaiming the red light district from tourists his top priority. Before the pandemic shut the city down, Olive was documenting what he considers to be the particularly shocking lack of manners on the part of visitors to his city. Prostitution has always been in this neighborhood, but when I came to live here, it was a non-tourist area. There was a large and a, and a strong local community. The communications between prostitutions, prostitutes, sex workers, I want to call it, and the local citizens, the residents, and the shopkeepers, etc., was very strong. But as a result of mass tourism, also the, the fabric of the neighborhood has been disturbed. So maybe formally when I came here, everybody was on the same side, but now we're on different sides. I believe the government is proposing closing down the windows here and yeah. moving every, all the, the yeah. red light district, the yeah. prostitution, yeah. to a, a designated area. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, that would probably mean that in the end, if the window prostitution is taken away from here and moved to another place, it would be one attraction, major attraction in this neighborhood less. So maybe, hopefully, probably, that would be less uh, attractive for, mm. for the mass tourism. I see. But of course, you do not know unless you try. Right, so for you, this is more about mass tourism yeah. than it is about window prostitution. Yeah. And the role of the window prostitution as an attraction, as an important factor for tourism to come to Amsterdam. Right. That's, that's what it's all about. Yeah. If everything is allowed, which is fine, it is not a license to misbehave. Great, let's go. This is a relatively new, well, let's say 10 years old uh, microbrewery, okay. which is a nice development. And you like that sort of thing? I like that kind of thing. Because? Because it attracts local people. Right. Also tourists, but it is a nice place. This is where I live. Olive isn't persuaded by the argument that the sex workers have a right to continue working in the windows of Devala. 
Well, apart from the safety issue, I could say, well, do the sex workers now ever realize or acknowledge that their being here also contributes, maybe might contribute, to the bad living conditions in the neighborhood for, for, for local citizens. And if they realize that that is the case, would their answer still be the same? Or would they say, I don't care? I do get it. I've been I've been living in, in a very busy area myself before I lived here. And it is annoying when someone pisses you on too much your front door. It's it's annoying when it's in the middle of the night on a on a on a Wednesday night and you have to get out in the morning at nine o'clock and people are still shouting in front of your window. That is annoying. But that's about the tourists and how they are behaving on the street. If you want people to behave, then you should to tell them how to behave. Yvette isn't opposed to raising the bar for tourists' behavior. In fact, she thinks it could benefit some sex workers. I could see how sex workers also benefit from less cheap tourism and more high-end tourism. But that's not about us moving away. It's about uh, making sure that if a drunk tourist pisses against someone's front door, you should find that tourist. It's like, it's not that hard. But controlling badly behaving tourists in the red light district is no easy feat. There are like thousands of people every day cramming through a small street, narrow, narrow alleyways. This raises a lot of safety concerns. And because of all those people in this small area, all the other challenges arise. You can push through, like if you push through, people will fall in the water. Yeah. Like the oh, only it's... thing you can do is walk and run and try to, hello, please, please get out of the way. Make room, make room, make yeah. space. If you've got these large numbers, do you have enough numbers to actually police a badly behaved crowd of drunk foreigners? No, not anymore. We are a little outnumbered, I guess. What could be a solution to this, do you think, in terms of like the numbers of people? And just from a policing point of view, what are, what, are there other ways of dealing with it? More police officers? Yeah, of course, more police officers. Yeah. Hi, this is a one way street, you need to walk around. Amsterdam employs citizens called hosts to try to help with crowd control in the red light district. But they have no real powers, meaning the police often struggle to cope. This is what we were talking about earlier. I see a lot of drug dealers and there's no police. Obviously one of the big attractions of Dvala is the red light district. If it was closed in Dvala, would that help relieve the pressure? That's a really complex question yeah. because if the windows are removed, they lose their uh, workplace. So where will they go? And, and they're still going to do their job. So, and then they'll go underground. When sex workers take their business underground, that means less transparency and can lead to an increase in sex trafficking. But the threat of sex trafficking is also the mayor's argument for shutting the red light district down. We would love to get rid of, of human rights violations and misbehavior. Everything that doesn't go right, it comes to us. If it's about human trafficking, if it's about bad work conditions, if it's about problems with the police. Hello, good morning. I'm looking for Helene. Yeah, come on further. While there are many Dutch sex workers in the red light district, the sex work industry in Holland includes Hello. people from overseas, working in different environments, from private houses and escorting to webcams. This is the prostitution and health centre, 292. I will show you around. Yeah. One of the reasons that the government has been saying they want to close the, the district is that they say, well, this district is a, is a, has got a problem with trafficking, with women being forced to work in prostitution. What are you, what are you finding uh, in regard to that? We don't know, we don't have any numbers. I always think that uh, in areas where you can earn a lot of money, you will always see people hanging around who think that they can take advantage or abuse people who are doing this work. But the thing is, I think when you're working in the legal branch, for example, in the brothels or in the clubs or in the private houses, all the places that uh, you're allowed to work, 
I think they're very well protected. If there is anything wrong, they can talk to the police, they can talk to us, they can talk to the people from the city council. So we provide a very good system um, that nobody has to work um, forced into prostitution. But it's not like we always see it. I think a lot of people work voluntarily as a sex worker. Um, and then you get always a little bit of discussion um, if you're from outside the Netherlands, for example, and if you want to come here, if somebody helps you to provide uh, the Chamber of Commerce, eh? if, how do you do it? Uh, how do you find an apartment? If somebody helps you with it and earns money from it, we also say it's human trafficking. What Helene is explaining is one of the grey areas that makes pinning down the number of trafficked women in the Dutch sex industry difficult. Simply providing assistance to a foreigner about how to become a sex worker in Holland is considered trafficking. This makes it difficult to know how many women are forced into the sex industry against their will. Estimates for those trafficked into the country's sex industry vary from several hundred to many thousands. Supporters of the red light district say that tight controls here make trafficking less likely than in more hidden places. Hi, Jack. Whether shutting down the red light district's brothels would make women more or less safe is hotly contested. What we always say is that for us it's really important that we have access to the sex workers. So that it's very easy for us to give them all the information they need to do their job on the most safest, best way. The thing is, the sex workers, who I know already for years, they know very well if they continue, if they want to continue working behind the window or not. So if they say, uh, I want to do it differently now, I don't want to stand behind a uh, glass anymore, then it's up to them. But as long as they are fine by working uh, in the windows, then it's fine. In Amsterdam's red light district, sex worker Yvette Lures acknowledges that whilst it's not her experience, some women in the sex industry are victims of exploitation. I think exploitation is always problematic. It's not like a blockbuster taken type of movie where someone is stolen and being put behind the window. Um, of course, um, there are horrible situations in, in people's personal lives and that's also the case in the sex industry, just as it is in, in other types of work. And, and I really like, I really like this, like the gloss, the see-through. It's almost like a magic wand. For Yvette, sex work is about empowerment and exploration, not exploitation and she wants to show me some of the tools of her trade. This would match my ukulele. Oh, <laughs> it does match the ukulele. People come with very different requests. Some people literally just want to talk. Some people want to cuddle. Some people want to be tied up. For Yvette, being empowered means owning her profession in all its detail. Well, these are all whips or floggers. Um, so you can use them to hit someone. Mm -hmm. Do a lot of people like that? A lot. Well, more people are into it than you expect. Really? And a lot of people don't know that they're into it until they experience it. Okay. Um, Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> Just... <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> trying to read you. <laughs> <laughs> I could see there was a look there. Yeah, so um, these are whips and floggers. Mm -hmm. And so would you use these regularly? Yeah, I have something like this, a mm -hmm. little bit heavier. and um, Heavier? Ouch. I find that really relaxing, actually. If you're into deep tissue, tissue massages, you're probably into heavy flogging. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Today, Yvette has another job needing her attention. Waiting around for the politicians to decide issues around sex work and the fate of the red light district wasn't enough for her. I realized that it really doesn't matter how hard you scream from the outside, that where you make changes, like in Parliament, because this is, that's where decisions are being made. 
Yvette has become an active member of a progressive party which has just won a seat in Parliament. I think we are seen as the activist party. Uh, we have a lot of activists coming from different communities combining their forces. I'm very happy with our party leader in Parliament who are already addressed uh, sex work and decriminalization several times now in the short time she's, she's in Parliament. Um, so, so you've got a voice? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's and yeah, that's that's really um, getting all emotional about it. <laughs> mm. To have a politician in Parliament speaking about sex work and sex worker rights, um, and and keeping and keep uh, keeping addressing that. That's yeah, that's beautiful. The fight for Amsterdam's red light district is far from over. I think if you move that part of the city, you take away like the soul of the city. Things changed. The ships that used to sail into Amsterdam had sails. <laughs> the neighborhood that's now considered the red light district 300 years ago was not the red light district. There was no prostitution. It was in another part of the city. Uh, the coffee shops are 40 years old, so what soul are we talking about? What's the future of this part of Amsterdam if these things happen? I, I wish I knew. <laughs> that, that's a tricky question. The name we tried to build all over the years, uh, like a river, liberal country and, uh, where people really want to go, to, to experience that kind of feeling, uh, the openness, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's gone, I think. I hope I'm wrong. <laughs>